Hi, good evening. Um, sorry we were a little bit late. Um, we've had a few technical issues behind the scenes, so hopefully the gremlins have now gone. So um, thank you for joining us. Um, and tonight's conversation is around adult social care here in Calderdale. Um, obviously, if you're joining us on Facebook, remember that you can share the page and you can um, ask questions of us. We will attempt to get through as many questions as possible tonight. Um, we'll be on air for about an hour. Um, so hopefully um, we'll have a really good conversation. So keep posting the questions and we'll try and get through as many as possible. So tonight um, I'm joined by three colleagues who work across health and social care here in Coldsdale. And just by way of introduction, I'm Ian Baines. I'm the Director for Adult Services and Wellbeing here in Coldsdale. And tonight I'm joined by Helen Hunter, who's the Director for Health Watch here in Coldsdale, Fiona Smith, who's one of our registered managers in our home care department here in Coldsdale, and one of our uh, providers, Shabir, who's the Chief Executive of Bluebird Care. I'm sure they'll get to introduce themselves as we go along. So um, I'd like to kind of proceed with questions. So um, if we can start seeing those questions roll in, that'd be great. So I think we're having a few problems with the, uh, with the questions coming in. So I'm just wondering whether if we start the conversation, that might help. So I'm just wondering if we start with um, a question for Helen, really. Um, obviously, the role of Health Watch is quite critical. So I'm just wondering what you've observed through um, the COVID period and what you're hearing from uh, people who use adult social care. Yeah, that's no problem at all. So, um, just in case people don't know what Health Watch is as an organisation, we are a kind of a patient champion, a public champion, and we take people's feedback about using health services and social care services. So that's hospitals, GPs, home care, care homes, the whole range of different services that people can access at the health and care support that they need. Um, during the COVID-19 period, we've been busy doing a whole range of things that we had no intention or plan to do because actually obviously so much about how health and care is delivered has changed. Um, but we have been um, speaking with a number of different people who have a variety of perhaps more complex or more challenging needs. Um, I think a lot of the people that we've spoken to have been very very understanding about the fact that the system has been under a huge amount of um, unprecedented and unpredicted pressure um, and that things had to be done in different ways um, and, and that wouldn't necessarily fit with what they expected. Um, I think as time is moving on there's perhaps a little less acceptance of that so I think people feel like stuff should be getting back to normal a bit more now um, and we're starting to hear more people asking questions about that sort of, sort of, sort of when will things return to normal um, and I think the honest response that we're giving is that normal might look a bit different going forward um, so we've kind of got to be prepared for some changes. Um, in terms of adult social care, do about the NHS because obviously few people use adult social care, um, I think in the first stages people asked a lot of questions about um, whether home care workers had the right personal protective equipment. Um, they asked about um, when the kind of groups and um, places that they visit might be open again for them to access. And one of the big sets of questions that we've had has been about family members who want to visit people in sort of residential or nursing care homes and when they might be able to get back to doing that rather than sort of digitally or through the window which some places have done um when will that kind of resume as normal business and um, so i think those are some of the key things that we've heard about thanks oh, that's really helpful and interesting we've just had a question posted about when we're able to visit my res uh, my family in a care home and um what you'll know uh, hopefully is that this week we've had some longer way to guidance 
for care home at home owners and registered managers to help them think through how they might manage the reintroduction of um, visits of family. And I know families have been really patient throughout the whole of the pandemic and they understand why there was a need for care homes in particular to lock down. Um, and obviously as we ease uh, lockdown, then people are keen to be to see their family. And, in, and it's important that families are able to see their loved ones because they're, they're an important part of the support team that support their, their mother or their father or their brother or sister. Um, we'll be working with care homes over the next few days just to help them understand the guidance and help them think through what that means to their setting. Because um, often guidance can be very, um, very blanket guidance that doesn't take into account the particular circumstances of a care home. And Helen referenced the idea that some care homes have already been enabling visits to happen in, uh, where there's been outside space. Not all care homes will have that space. So I think what you'll start to see over the coming days is care homes being really ready to, to welcome visitors, but probably not in the way that they have done in the past, but thinking about having a lot of time. So there's an appropriate time for PPE, for cleaning of waiting areas, etc. So hopefully we'll start to see that happen. And I'm just wondering as well, um, one of the things that um, Helen raised around care homes, uh, sorry, about home care, um, was about people being worried about PPE. So I'm just wondering, Shabir, as, as someone who runs a home care business, how did you manage with PPE throughout the pandemic? Uh, we were very fortunate, actually. Um, we have a, a good supply of our own, uh, which who we've been getting the gloves and aprons and all those kind of things from. Uh, but also, Codal Council uh, supplies have been excellent. Uh, throughout the, um, the epidemic, since March, uh, Codal Council have been buying uh, PPE and then uh, making that available to providers. And we've been accessing that, especially for, for the masks, because at one stage it was really difficult for us to get hold of the, the masks that we need the right type of masks uh, and we got those through the council so at the moment the PPE situation is is okay uh, we're getting regular supplies from the council and from our own supplier uh, but there is a bit of nervousness around gloves uh, i've heard some people say that it's getting more and more difficult to get hold of gloves but at the moment uh, fingers crossed everything is good that's great. Um, Fiona, I'm just wondering as well, obviously you're a registered manager of our home care provision. Yeah. Um, how has that been for you? Um, so again, in terms of PPE, I think initially um, we were waiting for our orders to come in and they were coming in very, very slowly. And I think that's just as the pandemic kind of hit round about March time. Um, but again, like Shabia has, has explained, you know, we've been using the council um, provision. So every week I'm able to put an order in uh, for that ne uh, next week and, and that's been delivered. So that's been an excellent service from the council. Um, I don't feel that um, our staff have gone without at any time. I think um, obviously I've got staff within extra care services, so they're using their masks on sessional basis. And then I've got two teams that are out and about in the community, so they're using it on individual um, uh, cases. So we have had enough and we do have we do have provisions still available to us. It was interesting at the beginning of the year um, on PPE, we, the council didn't have a big role in procuring PPE. Um, but interestingly, I was looking at some figures today and um, up until today, we've now distributed over one and a half million pieces of PPE to our, um, our social care providers. Um, and hopefully that's really helped with the situation and also given the public some confidence that the care that's been delivered to their loved ones is um, is done safely. Yeah, there's a question that's been put to me, but I think actually it's something that we'd probably all be able to contribute to the answer to. Um, we've been asked, could you clarify how disabled people who are exempt from wearing masks will be protected from prejudice when visiting the shops and public areas? Now, I think this 
relates to the fact that obviously there are some people with this, certain disabilities and certain needs that f for whom it's not appropriate to be wearing a face covering whilst they go out and about and kind of do their normal day-to-day -day business. But I think that there's probably a, a real concern that they might be approached by other members of the public to say, why haven't you got a face covering on or potentially be asked to do something by members of staff? And um, I know that I'm aware of um, people with autism. I'm aware that there are lanyards that you can have and passes that you can have um, so that you can present those when you go into like shops and the businesses um, in order to sort of state visually that actually you have needs that mean that you don't need to wear that ma those masks but i can understand why that must be something that is quite nerve-wracking for people who are in that situation um, and i'm not sure what else there's got to be other things you can do but i'm not certain that i could speak to what those are i don't know whether you guys have got any insights well, I'm, um, I'm a trustee for Disability Partnership of Coldwell, uh, and we've had concerns from our members uh, about the same kind of things. Even before the masks, uh, there was an issue around queuing. Some of our customer uh, members were not able to wait an hour or an hour and a half. Um, and it's a bit of a mixed bag. Some supermarkets and shops are very good, uh, but others are not. Uh, especially, you know, people, if they have like a hidden disability, so when you look at somebody, they, they look fine. Uh, and and, peop, uh, and shopkeepers and shop systems are not being uh, accommodating. Uh, and I think it's a, it's a public uh, kind of a information campaign that we have to do as all the care providers and as a general public. It's just getting that kind of message out to people that there are certain people that won't be able to wear a mask or won't be able to stay, stand in a queue for a long time because of, uh, because of their personal needs. I think that's a really um, helpful point, and I think maybe one of the things we might want to think of, obviously, um, face coverings will become much more common from tomorrow when we're all required to wear them in shops. And I think we hear the headlines about where the exemptions might be, but I think if we use our social media to kind of remind people that there'll be some people who can't actually comply with that and try and take the pressure off the individual to having to explain their individual position themselves. I think there's a follow up to the question on on there um, and you know, it might be best place to answer it about um, whether or not businesses have to accept the lanyards um, and I, I, I think they're more a signal than something that people have to accept yes. which perhaps is a barrier. Um, so, yeah, um, so I would hope you'd get compassionate shop owners and, and people who can understand that sort of thing but I don't think there's any requirement there. Yeah, as far as I know, it's no legal requirement. It's just somebody, um, uh, it's the individual shops and businesses, yeah, uh, yeah kind of showing that compassion and recognise the need. Yeah, I, I think maybe some of that's around um, getting information and communication out there to our business owners, um, you know, like the dementia friendly communities and just getting that information out there so that they've got more of an understanding. And I think that's probably where, where the difficulty comes from, really in that people might not understand that there's hidden disabilities and they don't necessarily see that. So I think maybe we could uh, look into doing some something around communicating that. What do you think to that, Ian? No, I think I agree with you. I think the um, we need to use all our channels of communication to make sure that people are supported. So I think that's well. I've just noticed there's another question. Um, and there's a question here about um, what is the data telling us in terms of who's most vulnerable? And obviously we've had a lot of focus on older people and particularly the extremely medically vulnerable, the over 70s. Um, but of course, what we're seeing now is that there are other uh, cohorts of people, so people from the black and Asian community, um, and there are certain professions that seem to um, have high incidence as well. So I think the data is telling us that we need to understand our communities better. Um, and to be able to work with our communities to uh, to try and work through what works for them. Yeah. yeah. Um, I've got a question. So um, I've got one here asking, uh, as the chair of the Hive charity, um, 
as a council, are we any nearer to getting a date when clients can return to those types of services? Um, obviously, there's a lot of um, questions from parents and carers. Um, and I suppose for, for day services and those kinds of um, services that are really, really important for our individuals, you know, if, if the service feels that they are fully compliant, they've done the risk assessments and they've got everything in place in order to take people safely back, um, you know, when, when are we going to be able to give um, dates in terms of returning to those services? Um, so, Ian, do you want to jump in on that one? Um, and I think we do need to work with all services to work out how prepared they are to um, receive service use. And I know that everyone's keen to get back to normal, but I think one of the things we have to be careful about is making sure that all the preparation is in place. Um, I think often with easing of lockdown, people kind of think that the virus still isn't present, but we are starting to see, with increased testing, more positive results here in Calderdale. So we do need to make sure that people understand how they, um, if, if they can't um, provide their care and support with appropriate social distancing, then we need to make sure they've got the right PPE. Um, our first line of defence in all of this is around social distancing, it is about hand washing, it is about um, some of those old messages around when we've got the cold and flu season about if it cough it, bin it, throw it. Um, and I think what we what we need to make sure we don't lose sight of is that whilst we're getting out of lockdown, it doesn't mean the virus has gone away. So we still need to be alert. We still need to make sure that we prepare things carefully. Um, and we're not, you know, we want to work with our providers to make sure they can get back to providing the care and support that they need. But we have to do that in a planned way. We need to make sure there's some risk assessments in place. But um, I think hopefully if we work together, um, we'll get through this. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to think that across the board and across Calderdale, we would have a standardised approach in terms of people making sure that they're doing the same across the board so that people are not, you know, some services are not doing one thing and other services doing another one. Um, I know that there is um, a service that's already opened and, you know, they've been very detailed in terms of their risk assessments. They've done um, RAG ratings with regards to their individuals so that they can be um, assured that the individuals coming into the service understand about social distancing and actually the staff have been working with some of those individuals where that might be more difficult for them to understand and grasp um, to make sure that they they are safe when they come into that particular service yeah i think one of the things that's really important at the moment is that we remember that we're learning as we go along this yes. isn't something that we have a blueprint for or that there's really clear answers to it feels like every day we learn well we learn something completely new and um, earlier on today i was in a meeting and i was asked about the range of feedback we've received about hospitals and actually when i went back five or six weeks the feedback that we heard then was totally different to what we're hearing now because everybody is on this journey of change all the time and i think there's something about us holding our hands up and saying sometimes we're working out the answers so that we can give you the really really clear information about how we move forward and how we how we take things on going forward yeah. um and because uh, we're certainly not getting it right all the time and there's people who can really help us on that journey give us information and good examples of how they have implemented changes and made things safer for the people that use their services yeah i mean um i also volunteer for maybe lane cafe uh, which is like a dementia friendly cafe uh, and a lot of our members are also kind of constantly ringing with volunteers asking when is the cafe going to start again when's it going to start again uh, and we had a meeting uh, last week and when I started going through the the needs and all the things you have to put in place, we just decided to leave it for another month because there's just so many things and unknowns as well in terms of what we can do and what we can't do. Uh, and and the, I think the important thing to kind of remember also is that what our members got from coming to these uh, events was was the interaction and if then you have to kind of wear masks and have to sit two meters apart and you, it's, it's just going to be a completely different kind of um experience to what they used to before covid so it's about kind of how do we go back and what is it going to look like when we go back as well yeah. isn't it and i think one of the most interesting bits of learning for us has been that some people have 
more connections to people whilst they are isolating at home because we've put stuff in place with volunteers where they befriend, where people do people shopping for them. Actually, it's not everybody, but there are some people who are better connected at this time, have more support at this time, and sort of are living a, a, a more fulfilling life. And it's important that we don't lose that as we move forward as well, yeah. that we kind of return some of that level of connection for, for people who might have disabilities that restrict them being able to get out and about. I think we've certainly seen that within day services. Um, so again, because our day services have closed, our um, staff have been going and doing some outreach service for some of the individuals that would ordinarily come into the day centre. And again, one of the things that they've found is that that has been even more beneficial for those individuals. You know, they've absolutely thrived on that one-to-one, -one, being in their own home, uh, where, where sometimes they can become a little bit distressed in the day service because their surroundings are different. And again, they've gone in as well. So not only for the person themselves, but also to give their carer um, some respite so that they can go out and, and have a bit of a walk and, and do those things for themselves to stay mentally well. So that has been really beneficial. And, and I think, like you say, Helen, I don't want us to lose that um, when the day services start to reopen, because actually, you know, services in that person's home might be more beneficial than coming back to the service long term. And uh, so we've also... I go <laughs> yeah, we experienced that similar kind of thing with our uh, memory lane customers because uh, when we stopped the cafes, uh, we uh, kind of uh, made small groups uh, and put them into contact. So they were now using Facebook Messenger and WhatsApp and stuff like that to keep in contact. So even though we've not kind of met as a cafe, people are meeting in small groups on using uh, social media and using uh, their phones. So I think in many ways, the bonds have increased amongst those people than from before. I think that's really helpful because I think often people think that somehow when lockdown occurred, a lot of social care kind of closed down with it. But in reality, what we've seen is our services been in more demand and people have adapted to try and support people in very different ways. And I'm hoping that one of the things that we'll take forward um, once we get further through the pandemic is to have, do a bit of a lessons learned and actually understand what's, what are the good bits that we've learned and what can we do to prepare for next time if, an, if a second wave occurs. I mean, interestingly, um, one of the things that we do know today is that the new information on um, the infection rates have been announced and it does show that in Calderdale, our our increase rate in terms of positive cases of COVID is, is, is starting to be seen. We have started from a relatively low base um, and currently in the week, um, in the period between the 9th of July and the 15th of July, um, there were approximately 25 positive cases per 100,000, um, which is starting to be an area of concern. It's that point I was talking about earlier, which is, you know, the virus is still around here in Calderdale. And what that will mean is that the government will have uh, Calderdale as an area of concern. And what we've done to help people understand what that means in detail, our Director of Public Health has posted something on the website just to help us understand what that means. Um, so if there are people who are concerned, please press, uh, please look at the website and hopefully there'll be some really useful information. Um, obviously, what we'll be doing over the coming um, days is to make sure that we can support those um, individuals who are testing positive, whether, whether they're in um, households or whether they're due to an outbreak in a workplace. But I think what we, what we need to be assured of is that we still remember some of those key messages, those basic prevention messages around hand washing, around social distancing and I know that as people have started to go to pubs more often and people are feeling that things are starting to ease we still need to use appropriate social distancing and in fact um, making sure we wash our hands etc yeah so I've got a question here um, which is just asking if I test positive for COVID-19 uh, will how I receive care be affected? Um, I'd like to think, no, it won't be. 
what we would do is we would make sure that we've got our carers that are consistent for that particular ind individual so we would have a team around that person again we would make sure that we've got the full ppe we would make sure that that person um has all the support that they need we would um engage in you know doing that, that person's cleaning deep cleans within the home obviously we would um also connect with uh, loved ones for that person like we have been and we're sure like you have been should be using um you know uh, FaceTime and Zoom calls and using all the technology that's available to us but absolutely no the care will not be affected should somebody test positive for COVID-19 they will still receive the same level of care and support. Yes uh, I mean we've not had a customer in Cordial but we also provide care in Bradford and we've had a couple of customers in Bradford who uh, were receiving care at home with uh, untested positive for COVID and yeah there's no difference really yeah. it's uh, it's just more extra precautions from our side and making sure we've got more PPE on and uh, and, the, and the staff know they've been well trained so they know what to do anyway uh, but there has been no kind of reduction in care just because the person has been uh, has tested positive for COVID. And I think that's really important just to reassure people um, you yeah. know that the service is still there for you and you know you Definitely. will like Shabir just said you will be well cared for you will be kept safe um, and you know and like I said the carers will be consistent to you so um, hopefully that can allay anybody's fears that they might have. Um, one of the questions that's been posted is, um, I think obviously on the back of the announcement that our positive rates are increasing, um, I think one of the questions is um, around how the council and our partners will work around a local outbreak. And an outbreak is often determined in terms of where there be more than two cases in a particular setting. Um, so we have a, a strategic and a tactical group that actually receives all that information and we have teams around that will work with if it's a workplace setting but also if it's in a household so there are some um, experienced and trained staff who will work with them to support whether it's a local outbreak so for example if it, that was in a care home we'll make sure that um, both staff and residents are um, are safe and well. Um, we will make sure that there is enough infection control mechanisms in place to reduce the risk of spread to further residents. Um, so I think what we've got is, is some well used mechanisms to do that. And in some ways, at the moment in Caldwell, we uh, if I think about our care homes, we've got thirty three older people and uh, residential and nursing homes and at this moment in time we've got one home where there's an outbreak which is being managed um, now that does mean that there are in that home there are four residents who are who have tested positive or are showing signs of covid but what that will mean is that they will be supported and cared for in isolation to protect those residents that um, and currently not showing signs of tested negative. Um, so I think there's there's well um, there's well organised procedures to manage that, and people shouldn't be shouldn't be concerned. I was just thinking one of the other questions that's listed for me um, is um, is about whether or not people can still be involved in kind of the community effort and supporting um, what, what is available for people at the moment and I was thinking about that in terms of if we're in a situation where we're concerned about risk or we are an area that is considered to be of concern and actually we can still be doing our bit to try and help our vulnerable neighbours to try and look out for each other and stay safe. Um, I know that the volunteer hub that was set up through the council and with voluntary sector partners is still functioning. Um, and I know that there's 
lots of people who might now have gone back to work after being furloughed or who, who so some of their volunteer numbers have dropped off so if people if people are still wanting to help out and they are still wanting to be part of that community effort and that community response to COVID and support people who live in their neighbourhoods and their communities. There's still lots of opportunities to do that and to kind of assist in this effort of keeping people safe and, and well um, and connected to the people who are around them because actually I think that's one of the biggest concerns, certainly from my perspective, um, is, is about people feeling disconnected from the rest of the world at this time so i think that there's still a lot that just your average member of the public can do by knocking on their neighbor's door and saying do you need me to be from shopping for you at a social at a safe social distance obviously being back, back to that old be a good neighbor campaign isn't it really and yes. i know that um, throughout the pandemic we've had hundreds and thousands of people volunteering across coldale and coldale's got a really rich history of um of volunteering and being kind to each other and I think that one of the things that we'll start to see is that um, I think that hopefully that vein of volunteering will will continue we know that on the 1st of August um, the the shielding of those most medically vulnerable will technically cease um, but that doesn't mean that um, that they can simply just forget about social distancing. So I think, right, Helen, you're right. If we can connect people to feel part of um, a community and feel supported, I think some of the anxiety that will happen when the first day that somebody works walks out of the house after being um, at home for the last kind of almost 14, 15 weeks now, it feels like, will be quite a daunting thing to do. So I think that help of volunteers and their neighbours will be um, will be really critical. I think it's it just goes back to what you were saying Ian, about um, you know Coldale. You know we are kind, we are resilient, and we've seen that over many years where you know communities do come together. And this is just another opportunity that's that's allowed that to shine through really. And I think you know as a borough, we you know we are amazing people. We are looking after it and looking out for each other and i think you know that's to be applauded absolutely yeah. um, there's a, another question i think it's obviously still linked to this um the announcement that we are likely to be an area of concern for the government in terms of our increased positive rates and i think what they're asking is um what does that mean in terms of support that coldale council might get from um, central government um, as I understand it, one of the things that will happen um, following today's announcement is there'll be uh, a conversation with government and with the chief medical advisors around um, what's needed in Calderdale. Um, and and we, I think it's probably important to remember that um, most people equate to these measures uh, probably linked to the um, intervention that Leicester and Leicester County had, um, but our rate is nowhere near that, and we're, we're less than a quarter of where they were in terms of their intervention. So I think, um, whilst I think it is important that we acknowledge that the rate is increasing, what we do need to make sure is that we understand what's happening in our communities and we work with our communities, and ensuring that people are supported to make the right decisions about how they um, look after themselves and their loved ones. So I've got a question um, here. How has the way the council approaches home care changed since the start of the outbreak of COVID? Well, obviously, I think we've already kind of touched on this, really. I don't think we've um, we've changed so much. Um, I think the way in which we do things in terms of like the face, uh, the FaceTime, the Zoom calls, connecting people with family members. I think we have had an increase in terms of some of the domestic tasks, such as the shopping and cleaning. Yeah because we were quite reliant on family members um, to be supported with that as part of their kind of weekly, you know, or daily visits even, um, you know, supporting people and, and giving that reassurance to loved ones where they can't be with 
with them if they're poorly or they're unwell. So again, it's just providing that that reassurance. I think probably an increase in communication, which is a really good thing, and hopefully something that we can continue with um, after after COVID and once everything kind of settles down a little bit and family members are able to come in, which they're starting to do as part of the bubble um, that, that's being created with families. Um, but I think that that's a really good way forward, and I do think that we need to continue with that. Yeah, I think same here for uh, for Bluebird. We had a similar kind of, um, you know, trying to keep our customers connected with, our, yeah. with their family members and an increase in shopping. Like you don't realize how many of our customers have their shopping done by their family members. Um, and some more social visits as well. So because uh, a lot of our customers were shielding and because the care is going in anyway, so we gave extra time to some of our, yeah. some of our customers. So they have that uh, that time uh, with them, uh, especially because we, they do, in many cases, the, the only people that, that come into their houses probably are carers. Uh, so we had an example last uh, last week or so where one particular customer was, again, very anxious about staying, like you say, about 14, 16 weeks in his home. Uh, so one of our staff actually made him a picnic and they, they had like a picnic in the garden. It was nice weather and she kind of took him outside and they had a like a walk around the garden and then had a picnic in the garden. So there's a, there's a little kind of small things that we're doing uh, to help people because we know they, they're at home and they're not able to visit. That just shows how different organisations can be in doing different stuff. Um, I'm just aware that we've probably got, got about 15 minutes of our conversation left and I'm just um, I've kind of noticed that the, the follow-up questions that are being posted are kind of slowing down and it's either you're really enjoying the conversation and being grossed in it, but if you've got any questions that you need answering, um, this is the time to post them because we've got 15 minutes left. Um, one of the questions that I think I'm often asked, and, um, and, it, and it's at the heart of a question that somebody's just posted, which is, um, do we think society values social care and its workers. Um, and interestingly, I met with a group of registered managers across Coldsdale last week, and there's about 30 on the Zoom call. And they were trying to talk to me about what, was this an opportunity to really value social care? And I think, um, I think there are lots of conversations going on um, at national government level about how social care should be funded. But one of the ideas that's been debated, and um, I do think this would help, is that um, people are talking about a, a national social care wage, um, maybe linked to something like the NHS Agenda for Change type pay scales. Because for many years, um, I think we have um, seen social care um, as low skilled and low pay. But actually, the complexity that social care workers do is immense. It just might currently have a very low monetary value. And I can't um, speak highly enough of the work that I've seen that people have gone over and above. And actually, I hope that one of the things that will come out of this is that government will start to appropriately fund social care, but recognise that social care workers are both highly skilled and they need to be highly paid. Yeah, That's I couldn't agree more. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's definitely, I think it's something that uh, is a concept on, on my mind as, a, as an employer, that the amount of responsibilities carers have in terms of medication and all the other things uh, that they do, uh, that the pay is not reflecting the level of skills and professionalism that they have. So something, some kind of national uh, kind of minimum standard would be fantastic. Yeah. I've clocked that a question come in um, that's, that re relates specifically to the befriending services and volunteers and the volunteer hub. Um, and as people return to work, will these services be, stop, be stopped? So from my understanding, and I'm involved in a couple of, of work streams that relate to this, 
this isn't a permanent setup, but there isn't any intention at the moment of pulling back on the sort of volunteer support. Obviously, there are people who've stepped forward who now have perhaps were furloughed, who have now returned to their workplace. So it might be that there are fewer people available to be involved. But, but as far as I understand, um, the volunteering hubs and things that have been set up the community will continue across this period of time um but like i said i don't think it's a permanent thing but it's certainly something that continues whilst people have needs that relate to covid19 there's a question about um about private customers and people funded as private customers or whether it's social services customers. And I just like to kind of reassure people that it doesn't really matter whether somebody pays themselves or they're funded through social services or the NHS. The quality of care everybody gets is the same. And it is uh, most of the care that's provided is provided by the private sector in anyway, like companies like ourselves. And we have customers that are funded through social services or NHS or private, and they all get the same quality of service. Okay, so I've just got a question coming in. Um, so how, how are the staff doing during COVID-19? We speak of the people that they care for, but how are the people who are doing the caring? Um, I think that's been a little bit of a mixed bag, if I'm honest. Yeah. Um, I think at the start, I think there was um, a lot of fear. I think there was a lot of people that were very, very anxious about coming into the workplace. Obviously, as a manager and with my team leaders, we've tried to reassure the staff that they are safe, that they do have the appropriate PPE. Um, I think, you know, I think for all of us, we've all had days where we might have had a little bit of a wobble and we've had a, a kind of a bit of reality check in terms of how big this pandemic is. Um, and, and obviously we're still providing our staff with supervision. We're still providing our staff with opportunities to come and talk to us. We do have within the council a peer to peer support so people can go and talk to somebody about any worries and anxieties that they might have that's outside of their um, colleagues and outside of their team that they work in. And I think one of the big things that we do focus on within uh, Calderdale and, and particularly within our council is about making sure that people's mental well-being is maintained and well looked after. Um, and I think one of the things that I have been saying quite a lot to my teams and to my staff, although we're going through the same pandemic, we're all in different boats. We've all got different challenges, different strains, different stresses, not only at work, but in our personal lives. Um, and it's about us trying to support people to manage those the best that they can. Um, and also just have that real understanding and compassion that what one person fears, somebody else might not, but that's not to take away that reality of that fear that that person has. I think uh, same here with our, sorry. Yeah, so same that, uh, yeah, I mean, same, I think similar to Fiona, for our uh, carers, when that first week when the, the shutdown was announced, there was a lot of fear among our, amongst our carers as well, because obviously they were worried about their own families saying, you know, they're out there, what if they, uh, there's more risk of them, them catching the virus and then they're taking it back to their families. Uh, and it was a similar kind of uh, conversations that we had uh, with our carers, as Fiona mentioned, is about kind of reassuring people, communicating with them, uh, and just talking things through. And like you said, there are some people that are, everybody has kind of a different level of risk tolerance as well. There are some people think, oh, it's nothing, it'll be fine. And other people are like, that are a bit more, uh, more worried. And the reassuring thing is that just this month, there's a study that's come out from uh, Public Health England, which did a survey of Dom care home care assistance and the general public and they found out the 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 risk of uh, uh, home care assistance being po uh, covid positive was same as the general public so there's no extra risk at all just because there somebody's working in home care so which is a good reassurance for us all I'm, I'm just aware we've probably only got a few more minutes left so i'm just wondering if there's kind of either any final reflections that you have or whether there's anything you'd like to leave people with? 
Um, I think for me, it's just about recognising the amazing work that our social care staff have done. You know, I know that, you know, we've done clapping for the NHS and, you know, and all those people yeah. that are kind of involved from a medical point of view. But again, we, we really need to consider the social care aspect for our individuals that we support, um, you know, making sure that they are mentally well, that they have been well looked after, that their families have had that reassurance. And, and absolutely, I think we need to, you know, take our hats off and applaud the staff that we have within Calderdale because they have been absolutely amazing. And without them, we'd be in a we'd be in a real pickle, wouldn't we? Um, so, you know, just a big thank you to everybody who is involved in care work, who supports our vulnerable individuals within Calderdale. Thank you. Um, I've just noticed um, there's a, a final question that I think is really important that we need to take. So it's on the back of, I suppose, um, the news about the, the rate increasing, which is, are care services prepared for a second wave for COVID-19? And I think we've started, um, it feels a little bit strange to be planning for a second wave when we're still working through and ensuring that we can mitigate and reduce the risk of COVID in our care settings. But we have started that work. I mean, someone kind of reminded me the other day that um, technically winter starts in about seven weeks time. Um, and we've got winter coming. We do have the flu season. And I think there is a potential for a second um, wave or, or, or spikes. And, and we have prepared for those. So, for example, on PPE, we're trying to um, create um, a stock supply so that we um, we aren't as reliant on regular drop-offs of PPE from our providers, but making sure that we've got a, a, an amount of PPE that will see us through any second wave. Um, we're working with all our providers um, to kind of work through how they might be ready for a second spike. Um, so I think we are ready. I think we've understood what what COVID is, has meant for us in social care. Um, it would be great if we had a bit of respite to kind of restore ourselves and re, re get our energies back. But I think we are prepared for a second wave. We're doing that planning. Um, I think we've we've faced the challenge that COVID's brought, um, and I think we will be better prepared if there is to be a second wave. I think um, everyone is much more acutely aware around infection control. Um, I'd echo, I suppose, as well what Fiona said, which is I've never been prouder to work in Coldale than I have been during this period. Um, we have a history um, and a tradition of dealing with setbacks. Um, you know, we've had a number of floods that um, issues and in reality we'd only had a few weeks respite from the February floods before COVID hit us um, but I think what we've seen is the best has come out of people um, and people have really stepped up to the plate and you know people have dealt with some really challenging situations and we've seen some really amazing care delivered um, so I you know all I can add is um, my thanks to everybody that's worked so hard yeah. So I like to say the same as well. Um, let's start with our Bluebird care staff, all the carers. Thank you very much uh, for everything you've done uh, over the, the last few months. Uh, and the team, um, and I've heard this from other care providers as well, all the carers, all the teams have really pulled together uh, and really kind of uh, upped their game uh, during this. I think, it's a, you know, when there's a, we have a challenge or there's a particular um, uh, issue people kind of step up and uh, definitely all the carers in our organization and the other organizations I spoke to before they have all really kind of clubbed together and worked as a team and helped each other out so when you had people off uh, because they need to self-isolate because they got symptoms their team itself kind of jumped in and helped uh, make sure that all our customers had care throughout so it, yeah it's uh, it's really reassuring how people really do bond together 
And I think there's another group of people to say thank you to as well, in terms of our unpaid carers, you know, family members oh, yes. who've gone out of their way to to kind of dedicate additional time to looking after um whether that's children who would normally have been at school in the daytime who might have some uh, some vision needs, whether that's elderly parents. There's lots of people who have you know, taking time out their own lives to to care for somebody, and um, when they're not receiving any uh, financial recompense for that at all, um, and this is a vital part of how we support people who perhaps are more vulnerable or have more challenges that they face. So I think we really need to celebrate unpaid carers and the contribution that they've made to people's lives during this time as well. Well, I'd like to just finish off as well <laughs> uh, with, uh, because one of the things the uh, biggest help for us was the schools that were left open so that our you know people our carers kids could go to those schools and that made a huge difference because for us, my kids were both at school because my wife and myself were both key workers and all of our staff's uh, children were also in school so that made a, a huge difference and finally all the retailers, because all my <laughs> retail friends will kill me if I didn't mention them. Because without the shops and everything else, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to do anything either. Um, I'm just aware there's one one final question that um, I think someone's posted. And obviously, it's a mum who's concerned about the news that we are seeing an increase in um, COVID positive uh, test results. And a concern is that her seven-year-old daughter um, dances um, and really enjoys dancing and she's been dancing outside. And I think she's asking for some advice in terms of whether she should, um, whether that's something she should engage in. And I think what we need to remember is that um, one of the things that we've learned about the virus is that um, activity outside does seem to be less of a risky activity. We do know that um, obviously if that if that activity is dancing that can be done at a distance and that it's um, individual dancing, then again, I'd encourage you. But I think what one of the things we will do is we'll post some things on, um, on the website just to kind of help people guide to where there's some really good information about how people make these um, decisions about whether it's something they should encourage their children to do or not to do. But remembering that um, on the whole, children aren't one of the high risk groups. So obviously that reduces the risk. Um, so I hope that has helped a little bit. Um, we are about to go off air. I just want to thank everybody um, for uh, tuning in. I hope you found it interesting. I want to um, thank my fellow uh, panelists for taking the time out of their evening to, to do this. Um, but I think it's just a final note. Um, just remember, and it will become a bit like a broken record. Remember social distancing. Remember hand washing. Um, and if we if we can in if we do this together, we will reduce COVID positive cases in Calderdale, and we will move on. So thank you for everybody. I hope it's been a useful conversation. Thank you, everybody, and good night.